John, first of all, again, thank you for, for being here. Um, a, a lot of folks in the room know some of the other gubernatorial candidates, uh, and this is an opportunity for them to share a little bit about yourself and why you're running for, for governor. So the floor is yours. Sure. So the uh, good morning. It's a great pleasure to be with all of you. Uh, as introduced, I'm John Chung. Uh, I think we're all a product of our life experience. So I am the oldest child of immigrant parents uh, who came to this country like so many others searching for greater opportunities. Actually, I'm going to pause and acknowledge a former colleague of mine, uh, Ted Lempert. Uh, Ted served all of us extraordinarily well up in Sacramento. Uh, the, uh, my parents, uh, my dad came to this country with three shirts, two pairs of pants, about a hundred dollars in his pocket, uh, but he understood that America provided the best opportunities on this globe, right? And if you want, what makes America transformative is the opportunity to pursue an education. So eventually my dad got his PhD. My mom came to this country, scrubbed floors, learned English, uh, and then I'm the oldest of four children. Uh, I sit here before you very humble. I didn't achieve my mom's dreams. Uh, when you come from South Taiwan, and if you wonder a lot of those things, uh, they want surgeons. And so all of my mom's four kids failed. My brother Bob got very close. He's an ophthalmologist who performs some surgeries. Uh, the, uh, <laughs> but my mom ended up with two lawyers, uh, ophthalmologists, and one who works up here at KQED, uh, a little bit north of here. Uh, my, my, my vision uh, of, of this state is just to make sure that the next generation, and I'm not blessed with my own biological children, so I sort of view the construct of the future. What I'm trying to create is a, a world that's even better for my six godchildren. Right? The, I can't believe my friends would choose me to give spiritual guidance uh, for, my, uh, for my godchildren. Uh, but you know, I sit on this stage blessed by the sacrifices and struggles and hard work of those who preceded me. And I want to make sure that we create an America, frankly, a lot of which I don't want them to live, uh, that's different and better. Uh, my family was the first Asian Pacific American family in our community in suburban Chicago. Uh, Dave Jones, our insurance commissioner, was my high school classmate. So he, would t he will tell you the stories of the discrimination my family faced. And so there's nothing like being a child of six or seven, and you're the one who looks different. Right, to be treated as a second-class citizen, to say you have no value, to not be included. Right? All, uh, when you're a kid of six or seven, you just want to ride the bike to 7-Eleven with everybody else, and kids don't want to be with you. Right? And so I want to create a world that embraces, that is supportive for everybody, and one that doesn't treat anybody so that they feel excluded. Right? And, I'm just, I bring that up in part because I'm, I was just pained right before I went to uh, bed last night. I was, I was, I don't want to say wasting time, but I was just, you know, just looking through different stories and I was, you know, caught a couple of stories. Rosalie Avila, I don't know if anybody saw, read that about, right? Rosalie's a 13 year old who committed suicide. Uh, and I, I can only imagine, right? The, uh, she wrote a note saying, uh, you know, mom and dad, sorry for doing this, right? But she was told she was ugly and all those things, right? And then some of us saw that story with Keaton, the Knoxville uh, young man, right? He, who's you know, told he's ugly and all these other things. So we need, we need to create a better world. And we need leadership, right? Unfortunately, I think, uh, and I don't want to get too political, right? But we have leaderships that, that's lacking in Washington, D.C., right? Whether it's harassment, intimidation, bullying. Uh, why we're here together is we care about our kids and what the lives they live. Great. Well, thank you, John, for that. Uh, speaking of, I want to talk a little bit about the national uh, uh, clim climate that we're in right now with politics, so we are going to get a little bit political. Uh, but before I do that, I wanted to talk a little bit about uh, your, your role uh, and the many roles you've had in state government uh, versus controller, now as state treasurer. Um, and you've, you've been you've earned both praise and scorn for some of the stuff you've done. Primarily, the thing I'm thinking about is withholding uh, pay for, for legislators if they didn't pass a budget. Um, and that type of decisive action that, that you took at the time, how will uh, actions like that translate uh, to, to more decisive action when you're governor? What are some of the things that you're thinking of um, when you become, if you become governor to, to take the similar decisive action 
uh, on doing what's right for, for California. Yeah, I, I think the, one of the things we need to do is we need to co-create uh, the, you know, you'll talk about different steps. We, I want to bring and create a California where we're, we're working together as you are today to focus in and put into place actions that build the future that we want in California. And that action was also painful, right, because the, uh, I'm a Democrat based on values, right? I mentioned discrimination, so I, I was, uh, came to the Democratic Party because of civil rights. Uh, and you, know, you still bring your childhood memories. And so all these friendships that I built climbing the ladder in politics, right, building trust. Uh, for two years, I was in the doghouse, right? Other Democrats wouldn't talk to me because I didn't pay, pay them. And I called them out on passing a phony budget. Right? But what's important about your leadership is those who are straightforward and speak honestly to you. Right? Because I was right. Technically, I, I was right. Legally, technically, I was wrong. Right? I didn't pay the legislature. But I've been, I had been telling them for a couple, few years that they, they keep budgeting incorrectly. And I made that clear to all of the people of the state of California. Right? One of the first things I did when I became the controller is I started posting for everyone to consume and review the state's numbers, right? Because I have a fundamental belief that I trust you, and I believe in our democracy, and people ought to be able to comment on it. And you know, we heard from the former governor's Department of Finance, John, take that information down. And we said no, right? This information is required to be public. Now, how you communicate it publicly, make it whether you make it easily accessible or you put it in a hard copy on a shelf in the controller's office is not the perspective that I take. I think you make it available for all. And then we said, by the way, the legislature's representatives will contact us during budget session and we'll tell them the same thing. And a few months later, we heard from the speaker's office, you know, tell John to take that information down. And we said, no, we told the same thing to the governor's office. And what was really powerful a month later is, in 2007, the economy at that period of time is still performing well in the state of California. But July 13th, 2007, California's finances go into a negative cash position. So we've mismanaged our finances, even though things on the surface look okay. And they had repeated that time and time again. Right? There is a reason we had to defer $10 billion worth of payments to education. There's a reason we had to pull back about 17 services that were provided from Medi-Cal and other healthcare services. And so somebody had to keep the promise to everyday Californians. Right? The, and my job is to make sure that we create a better California for all. Right? So as, as hard as it is the, uh, right, to lose the people around you, right? because everybody wants to be liked, you have to do the right thing. And I was willing to do it when it wasn't popular. What are some other uh, unpopular things that, that you may do a, as governor to do what's right for, for the state that you've thought of and, and are part of your platform now? Well, the, the, there's, there's going to be, I, I consistently do it. The, uh, you know, <laughs> part of that is just refocusing on what we do and changing the way we do practices. And it happens internally. It happens internally. Uh, so when I became the controller, so as, as asked, in the treasurer's office, we process $2 trillion worth of transactions each year. And so one of the things we want to do is we, you know, this is the center of innovation, right? Here in the Silicon Valley, you have the highest performing economy in the United States of America. And so the, uh, I chair about a dozen economic development authorities. In the past, they had operated in silos. They didn't communicate with each other. They, they might like each other individually, but they were suboptimal in performance. And so as we brought in a lot of the senior management team, I had been previously the controller and brought them into the treasurer's office, we said they operate in silos. We need to be helping the public better. We need greater efficiency and effectiveness. So we're going to go to each of the executive offices and say, we're going to take money out of your division, and we're going to use it for general purposes. Now, uh, so. I'll use a little story to be illustrative. So people used to ask, 
you know, I'd go to these forums, they go, John, how's cybersecurity going to affect the treasurer's office? And I said, we're cyber secure, like being semi-serious. We're cyber secure. What do you mean? You guys handle all that money. I said, we're cyber secure. And then said, please explain. I said, we still process transactions in the treasurer's office by paper, right? <laughs> by paper, right? Three years ago. Talking about inefficient, right? The, uh, and right, where, when I was really scared about access to financial information, our financial security, we had water damage my first year in office. I was thinking, uh-oh, that's what I'm concerned about, right? The, but we've updated it. So for instance, today, when we process those $2 trillion worth of transactions, a huge chunk are our interactions for the state and for city and county governments. We used to bank by phone and fax. Can you imagine you banking by phone and fax, right? Remember, I'm the state's banker. So you say, hey, John, the, uh, I want to take out a million dollars to fund parks or schools, right? We say, OK, you know, we'll give you a transaction number. We're going to fax over the confirmation. And then you can go get the money. How inefficient, right? Today, it's online in the treasurer's office. But it's taken a while. It's taken a while. Yeah. yeah. And so you, right, you rub a lot of people the wrong way by up trans, uh, transforming practices. That's great. Thank you for that. And you mentioned Washington, D.C. earlier. Uh, one, of the, one of the things everyone is tracking really is how uh, tax policy, health care policy, and uh, a bunch of other policies will be affecting states and, and local government. Um, as we are, as we've recovered from the recession, the economy is doing well right now, how do you think um, some of those federal policies could be affecting, if not thwarting, our, our recovery here in California? Absolutely devastating, right? All that progress that we made uh, will go, I don't want to say all for naught, but uh, will have dire consequences to the state. Uh, so at one point, some of you remember, I was trying to, as your controller in 2009, keep California from defaulting on debt. Now, other jurisdictions defaulted on debt. Think about them today, Puerto Rico, Greece. Uh, I wanted to make sure that, right, it would have taken a series of those transactions, but I wanted to make sure that California uh, did not, you know, have to pay unduly high rates for borrowing. Ther Thurman's an expert in all of this. Uh, we as Californians already were paying 1.71% higher interest than other similarly or AAA rated states. You think, ah, 1.71%, right? If you're a student, you don't want to pay 1.71% more. Your mortgage, you don't want to pay 1.71% more. And when you're the state of California and you're borrowing billions of dollars, right, that 1.71%, if you save that, that's a nice chunk of change we could use for early childhood education. But a lot of people don't pay attention to all of that finance, which is absolutely critical if we want to build and invest in the things that are absolutely crit, uh, important for the, uh, for the state of California. Uh, so President Trump and the Congress's proposal uh, really smacks it to us in multiple ways, right? And so I, I try not to jump on the same bandwagon that everybody else is, right? The, I, I take on the more technical things to make sure that we educate California. So one of my top priorities when I became the treasurer keeping the promise I did when I, became, when I campaigned, as I said, I am focused on, as the treasurer, to build more affordable housing here in California. Right? We're one and a half million units short. As you presented, right, we are the world's, right, we're the world, it's arguable whether we're the world's fifth or sixth largest economy, the, uh, you know, battling with France. Uh, However, one in, every five, one in every five of us, one in every five of us lives in poverty. Income levels, right, when you match things are pretty much like other states, but when you add the cost of housing and transportation, it drives our numbers higher, right? So I wanted to try to, because my big issue since I've been in public office is I want to be the elected official who eliminates poverty or tries to destroy the entrenched cycles of poverty in California. And so I wanted to build more housing. And so this is why I was taking the lead, and people don't follow it. 
66% of our affordable housing built in the state of California out of the shops that I use, right, and I sit on three of the state's four housing authorities, uses private activity bonds. Washington, D.C., or the House Plan, wants to eliminate the tax exemption of private activity bonds. We already have a housing crisis. Could you imagine having lack of access to financing for 66% of affordable housing? Right? That's why I took the lead on it. That same private activity bonds we use to build airports, we use to build schools, we use to build health facilities. Right, if you care about hospitals, right, you think healthcare costs are already too expensive, that loss of a private activity bonds is going to drive up the cost to build healthcare facilities, and who's going to pay for all of that? That's all going to be the pass-through to the patient. So I know it's technical. I know for many of you it's boring, right? but I care about what people's pocketbooks look like, right? how much of it's coming out. And I don't, that action by Washington, D.C., is a massive cost shift to people who are already overwhelmed, stressed, struggling, and we need to stop it. Thank you, John. It, I wanted to drill a little bit deeper on, on what you mentioned around families, families in California, particularly for the Choose Children initiative, families with young children. So you talked a little bit about it. I'd love to hear just broadly, what is your vision for children in California and their families who are supporting them? Well, every, every community ought to be one that's flourishing, right? That's how I imagine California, right? Regardless of whether you come from Guatemala or whether you come from Nigeria or you're like my parents and you come from Taiwan, you know, my parents starting off at low, lower middle income and then my dad moving us and mom moving us into middle income, they like so many Californians today, they, they spent a little bit more on housing, probably putting a little more pressure on themselves to get us into a school district uh, that had better possibilities, right? So the high school that Dave Jones and I went to would fluctuate from the 75th to the 37th best high school in the state of Illinois. Mm -hmm. uh, we have to make sure that there's significant investment in every community. One of the things about my service that's been different is how do we make that possible, right? So my first elective office was the Board of Equalization. Anybody have a clue what the Board of Equalization does? I got one, right? There, two, three, thank you, Kim, four, right? <laughs> Board of Equalization, five. California's elected tax authority, right? Now they had some corruption issues this last year, so it, it changed, right? Now, not, I used to, my first job after law school was to work at the Internal Revenue Service. Uh, so clearly I was not planning a political career, right? You know, like a, nobody starts off working at the Internal Revenue Service saying I'm gonna run for office, right? Because you normally start off getting booed. The, we still boo our tax assessor here in San Francisco. <laughs> I know, yeah. well Larry likes that attention. Yeah, Larry does. The, uh, <laughs> uh, but it gave me that sense of feeling, right? The, so I go to work at the IRS and you get this mini audit, right? They're going through, it's like, you know, how did you spend your money? How did you earn your money? And right, they, did your parents help you with college? And I said, oh yeah, they, you know, you know tuition was, I think, it was like 11,000 11, my first year, 12,000 my second year, 13,000 at Georgetown Law, right? And you had the living expenses. And they said, your parents help you? I said, oh yeah, they worked really hard. They gave me some and they gave me like 5,000 this year and something that it's like, oh, I, and then I'm running in my mind and go, God, am I getting my parents in tax trouble, right? I'm thinking, what, I go, I don't know what the gift limits are, right? I don't know if they reported anything. I'm thinking, oh, damn, right? The, uh, uh, so when I got to the Board of Equalization, right, instead of a tax compliance agency, you know, I wanted to turn it into a service-based agency. So a lot of the tax programs, and some of you might have been to them because some of my great colleagues picked them up. I was the first state elected official, at least at the Board of Equalization, to do free income taxes. Why? Because why would we today in the state of California leave a billion dollars back with the federal government when that billion dollars plus could be in the pocketbooks of hardworking Californians? And that's controversial. When I ran for controller, a nearby technology company put a million dollars in to support my opponent 
to stop me from getting to the controller's office because I wanted to give information about what the state had on their taxes and to put it on a piece of paper. Then I wanted to put it on a calculator function. I said, I'm not trying to stop them from electronically filing, right? But I want people to have a better understanding about their own finances, right? Because it breaks my heart when you have a poor family under the FPL who can get $5,000 back from the federal government. We as state officials have an obligation to make sure that they can change the trajectory of their lives. And then I believe in we, right? Too much of politics back in Washington, D.C., especially, and sorry, I'm going to be political, with the president is about me, right? It ought to be about we. And so uh, I created nonprofit seminars because we know that nonprofit organizations such as yours help the community. And I saw too many nonprofits get into tax trouble with the Board of Equalization, right? And it would break my heart sitting on the dais listening to a nonprofit's case. And when you, by the time you're before the quasi judicial authority on tax matters, you basically lost. Right? You basically lost. And I'm thinking, this is not a good place to sit. Right? I want to get us ahead of the curve, trying to address these issues, instead of at the end of the line where we're making decisions that impact people who are trying to serve each other. Some of you have gone to the religious and church seminars, right? because we know people are very faith-based. Many people are faith-based. I did religious seminars. And then we know people are at different places on the economic spectrum. And we know a lot of immigrants come over and they open their restaurant or their food shop or dry cleaners or something like that. So I, I started doing targeted small business seminars. Right? So we do seminars in Thai. We do seminars in Spanish. We do seminars uh, in Mandarin. Right? Because we wanted to help those small businesses. I had a person who had a tax issue. He was South Asian. Uh, I met with him in my then Van Nuys office. He said, you know, I immigrated to this country bought my first gas station, thought, wow, this is nice, right? This is an opportunity that I don't get in my homeland. Open his second gas station, goes, hey, I'm making it, right? Can buy a house, I'm doing really well, buys his third gas station. He gets hit with a bill by the Board of Equalization, $500,000. He goes, he forgot to pay one tax over that whole period of time, the underground storage maintenance fee. We used to see a lot of gas station owners that little tank they have, you know, holding all that gas, right? He forgot to pay that one, right? The, uh, he, was, he was devastated. He goes, I don't know how I'm going to survive, right? I don't know how I'm going to keep my house. I don't know how I'm going to get my kids to college, right? He goes, I have to figure out how to pay this bill. So the, uh, right, sort of that's perspective, right? We want to get in early to try to make sure that people can succeed instead of on the back end where we're, we're repairing damage, right? So that's why early childhood education is important. You want to be there early. You don't want to be there late because the consequences are expensive and sometimes, right, the fix isn't good enough. Thank you for that, John. We, talking about the we, and we've shared this with your, with your uh, staff, uh, SVCF, and the Choose Children campaign uh, did a voter poll uh, over the summer. And we asked voters, likely <coughs> voters, what do you expect from your next governor, especially when it comes to investing in babies, infants, toddlers, preschoolers? And nine out of 10 voters said that they want a governor who will invest more early. What do you make of that type of nearly unanimous support for a candidate who invests in young children. Yeah, I, was, I, I wish that was one of my investment choices. Right, right every day in the, the, uh, in the treasurer's office, uh, right, we have a portfolio of 65 to $85 billion. Right? Anything that we choose to invest in, right, in return, it's not going to be as strong as uh, what an investment in early childhood ed education is going to return. Great. And speaking of that, in your campaign website, you do talk about early childhood as, uh, quote, the smartest investment. Uh, tell us a little bit about that smartest investment uh, early on, but also your roadmap for education, as you call it. Uh, so you got to start right away. So the, uh, my mom, my mom was always did the, uh, my, my mom was always all in in the family. Right, the, uh, my mom, my mom uh, would, she does. She gives the shirt off her back. My mom's very Catholic, too. She gives, 
a lot of money to church despite the, uh, you know, how much he collects each month in Social Security and other, other things. Uh, and so I just remember, uh, I'm the old, as I mentioned, I'm the oldest of four kids. So uh, my brother, who's the doctor, is a year younger. My sister's eight years younger. And my baby brother's 10 years younger. And so when my sister was born, and then, you know, like when she's two years old, and Kim has to listen to this story again. The, uh, but it is, right? The, uh, so early childhood education, image-wise, is my mom. Okay, so I'm all in, right? Because I'll do anything for my mom. The, uh, so my mom, it, when my sister's two years old, just pulled out the flashcards. They weren't purchase flashcards, they were homemade flashcards, right? And so every day my mom would just drill my sister, one plus one, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, right? there. And I said, Mom, she's too young. She goes, no, you're wrong, John, right? She goes, she's learning, right? She may not be able to respond right now, but she's learning. Right? And I said, you do it with us? She goes, I did a lot more. She goes, you're a slower learner. Right? The, uh, <laughs> and my sister, because my sister was smarter. Right? The, uh, uh, we went to the same law school, and she, 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 she was much better. The, uh, but uh, right? it, so yeah, it, ha it, it has really powerful consequences. Right? And so you know, that's just the personal story. I mean, all the evidence is clear. Right? The, you know, what happens, you know, the ability to socialize, you know, uh, you know, you know not, in, not following a pathway that engages in things that are detrimental, right? Not entering into the criminal justice system, right? Neural connections, you know, at five or six days old, right? The, uh, you know, I mean, the incredible abundance and bounty uh, that attach to an early childhood education uh, can't be overstated. I want to talk a little bit about um, the, the family support, too, uh, around uh, early childhood. Uh, do you support uh, policies such as employer-based uh, paid family leave, for example, to, to care for a newborn? I do. Great. And in terms of your, because uh, whoever's elected governor, one of the first things on their plate is going to be the budget. And, and you're very familiar with that process, of course. Uh, what are some of the things you would uh, include and or eliminate in your first budget, and particularly around early childhood, what are some of the things that you would focus on in your first budget? So early childhood education, right, so the, uh, you can just Google me or just listen to my other speeches. I consistently say the uh, education's my top priority. And then I said within the subset, if you call it subset of education, early child education's also at the top. Right, the, and I'm not saying it because I'm here, right? Kim's heard me where there's been higher education advocates and others, the K through 14, who do a significant pushback. I said, right, you have to start early, right? Because, right, do you want to come in halfway through? Do you want to come in at the end? Right, if you're going to do this going forward, right, you have to invest in the piece that's underinvested, and you have to invest where you can get optimal returns, right? And if you're going to change trajectory, right, the, you know, why would you invest everything later on and you can't get the first, you, once again, you screw up the beginning, right? The, the sort of watching, the, what moved me was also like Hurricane Katrina. So the, uh, I went and visited the damage of Hurricane Katrina, and then you see some of these things where they're rebuilding to the same standards that had flaws that didn't stop the great injury to others, right? So it's like, why are you saying you're fixing it if you're going to rebuild to the previously substandard uh, uh, structure that you need. And so that's why you have to go in with early childhood. I'm supportive of all of it, right? But you have to get the first part right. Right. And then, you know, our, our, our budget, is, as you pointed out, we, we have huge issues going forward in California. Right? You pointed out, that's what distinguishes me from the others, right? And the others are bright and talented, some incredibly articulate. Right, but you have to understand how all of this works to minute details, right? Because there, there's a reason we had the financial crisis in 2009. I think that's what separated me from the others, right? You notice everybody went one way, and I went, I went the other way, and Bill Lockyer went with me. Right, so there's two of us going one way, and everybody else is going the other way. And we were trying to bring everybody along to say, hey, I've been put, posting this information for a year, right? We all should have known, right? And I, I offered, 
I offered to every single caucus, right? Re Republican Senate, Democratic Senate, Democratic Assembly, Republican Assembly, to give an understanding of how the st state's finances were. And I said, you guys are making optimistic projections. And then they said, John, how did you know, right? The, uh, right because we were also challenging Governor Schwarzenegger. And he said, hey, we, got, we have economists out of the same shop, right? Because I had an economist out of Chapman, Governor Schwarzenegger had an economist out of Chapman, right? He had the, he, he had the president who was the, the professor of my economist, right? Who was a tenured faculty there, right? But we said, you guys were optimistic. You guys were overly optimistic. And we, we took the more prudent path, right? And, you know, at the end of the day, you guys were off by $15 billion, right? Why I was issuing why I held back your tax refunds, right? And I used to have people yell at me in public meetings, right? Just chase me, right? It's like, why are you giving me IOUs, right? You dirty, rotten scoundrel, right? How could you do that? I said, I, said, I apologize. I'll apologize for Sacramento. I said, but do you think I wanted to issue IOUs, right? I know how painful that is. You have to make rent, right? You have to put food on the table. So I'll accept the responsibility with the rest of the people in Sacramento. You have to remember what real people are facing. And so in this context with early childhood education, we're going to have to build a coalition, right? Because we shared, in these campaigns, candidates are promising a lot. Candidates are promising a lot, right? So some people say, hey, John, you know, and I don't like it when they say this, you're not as ambitious as the others. But I said, we have to pay for stuff, right? Everybody wants something. I can't say yes to everything. I'd like to say yes to everything, right? Some of the healthcare changes they're talking about are $106 billion to $200 billion more. Our general fund budget's about $121 billion. Our all-in budget's $180 billion. How do you think, do you think everybody wants to double up on their taxes just on one issue, right? If we're talking about early childhood education, right? I said conservatively four billion. Kim says, no, it's a lot more, right? So this is how my brain works, right? Because I think about it, not in just in this context. I said $4 billion, okay, for every penny that we bring in, right, it brings in three and a half to $5 billion, depending on whether the economy is hot or not. Right, so that's the type of thinking. It's like, the, what are we gonna do? And as an additional wrinkle, we know that with what the federal government's doing today, right, somebody has to think about tax migration. Some of our folks are gonna leave this state. Because right, when you have to pay, when you're not going to be able to deduct and you've got to pay additional money, the, and so we're going to have to find some money. The rich aren't going to, who can't pay, some who can't pay additional more are going to be challenged. Those who are on the lower income spectrum are going to be really challenged. Uh, well, everybody's challenged, but it's like, how do you sustain this? Right. Right, so it's like, how do you construct finding additional revenues when you're not going to be able to deduct as much on property taxes and income taxes, which leaves sales taxes. And then, right, the uh, former administration, Governor Schwarzenegger's administration, right, because, you know, some of us talk about tax on services. That's incredibly unpopular, right? The, uh, and so, and you'll have people from this community, the technology, who don't want it on services. So what do we do to try to find money for early childhood education, right? That's, that's a tall political task. So, John, you had mentioned uh, uh, quickly about equity in the budget, and in the, during the recession, early childhood program services made up about 3% of the general fund budget, but were slashed by over 20%, uh, and some of that has been reinvestment, re reinvested over time with a lot of effort, as, as you know well. Um, the four billion dollar you, you threw, figure you threw out, is that something that you'd be willing to, to work on, to invest in, in your first budget and subsequent budgets? Uh, so it will get a disproportionate amount. The, I can't commit to amount today because we don't know what Washington, D.C. is going to do. Right, so right, when they talk about eliminating CHIP, when they talk about el eliminating uh, CalFresh food stamps, right, the, there's a lot of things they're going to wipe out. So part of this is the, when I get to the, the governor's office, if given the incredible privilege, right, I'm going to have to figure out how we bring everybody together, all the different programs and all the different services, to figure out 
right? That child and his or her family, what are all these services you need, right? Because we need early childhood education, but we also want that child, well, they'll get, they'll get it through childcare and others. We want to make sure that kid doesn't come to school with, without a roof, coming from a roof over their head or a consistent roof over their head, being food insecure, right? There's a, a lot of issues. I, I used to contribute to a, a group called City View, right? And Kim will get her that story. Like, my friend used to work there. And it was this story of a kid who, in first grade, did very well. Second grade, his performance just dropped dramatically. They went in, they tracked him, and he, he would go home, right? Really nice kid. And he'd go home, and his mom was making tamales, and they'd be out on the street until 11 p.m. or 1 a.m. until she sold the tamales. He was so exhausted. By the time he'd come to school, his performance just wasn't there. So it's like trying to put all those conditions together. Right, and I think you mentioned that in your, in your website uh, as well uh, as part of the wraparound services, yes. and, but also the, the basic needs for, for all families. And we'll touch on that in a second. I wanted to talk about another piece of the infrastructure, and that's teachers and early childhood professionals who care for, 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 for babies and preschoolers um, before they enter school. In California, half of early childhood teachers and child care workers are on public assistance themselves. Uh, and many of them make less than minimum wage to do the important work, as you said, the smartest investment. What would you do as governor to ensure that our educators, our early childhood educators and child care workers uh, are meeting ends meet while doing this important work? Well, the, uh, I think that speaks to you know, when, you, when you do, just a, right in a general sense, at when you look at California and our, you know, the funding provided per child, right, we're in the bottom 10. And so at our, one of the core issues for education is financing, so or funding. Uh, and so it's critical that obviously we provide the funds so that you can provide for the educators and the child care workers, right, and the over a period of time they will meld. Uh, so that they get the support. There's the incentives, right? Because you're not going to keep, and experience matters. Experience matters, right? The, you want people learning, and you want people, and SEIU is working on it, right? They're, they're trying to get with their child care workers, trying to build a college, right? A pathway to higher education. And so that's what we want to create, right? Because you're not going to hold people. And then especially, you know, those studies and the Harvard seminars on early childhood education, you, you want those who are, have expertise, they have competence in their, in their fields. Uh, so obviously you have to have investment, uh, whether it's pay, right, access to housing, student loan forgiveness. Uh, for those actually who want to transfer over, right, the access to certification programs that work so that you don't have individuals who have to go back and restart their entire educational process. Thank you. And I just wanted to, I have two last questions and then we're going to turn it over to the, to the <coughs> audience for, for some questions here. Uh, I wanted to follow up on something you said around um, what, what, what we could do uh, to, help not, to help Sacramento and Washington is, is on the local level. And I think you've talked about in the past uh, your desire to, to lower thresholds for raising, raising taxes locally, particularly around education and early childhood. Can you talk a little bit more about that uh, and um, sort of what your vision is uh, if you're elected governor to making those thresholds a little bit easier like we've done with other issues? Yeah, well, we, obviously we, we destroyed that system, right? You, you had Proposition 13, <coughs> so we disconnected budgeting, well, and we're get, starting to give it back, right? With, LCFF and all those things, right? But we, we detached, disconnected uh, budgeting from the ability to raise revenues. Uh, and so, right, you have people who are on the ground with local expertise, who have the relationships, who can be responsive, and they don't necessarily have consistent access to funding and financing, right? There's two pieces, funding and financing. Uh, and so I wanted to give, uh, or send back authority, right? It changed under Prop 13. We want to make sure that those in communities that need access to additional revenues, and I know we all need additional revenues, but 
some communities will choose to move forward and others will not. And then on the back end, we're going to have to try to figure out you know, how to find some equity uh, when you have disparate practices or disparate actions. Uh, but to give the authority back to local governments to find additional funds to make sure that they can address uh, whatever early childhood education, you know, the uh, after school programs, arts access, music access, STEAM labs, uh, whatever they need. Great. Thank you, John. One last question for me, and it's a pretty direct one. Uh, we're not going to hold you to the number, $4 billion, but if you're elected governor, do you commit to uh, investing more in early childhood education, child care, birth to three programs uh, as governor? Do you commit to investing more in all those areas? Uh, Boy, if I, if, if I haven't answered that clearly already, then I haven't done a good job. So, I, yeah, it's, it's absolutely yes. Great. Thank you, John. Yeah. Once again, please uh, uh, thank uh, State Treasurer John Chung for being with us. Thank you. What I, what I heard from John is a commitment to increase uh, early learning funding uh, despite some difficult challenges that we're going to have. So we appreciate that uh, from you. This is a group that's committed uh, to those issues and the, and the Community Foundation is committed to using our voice to lobby and advocate on behalf of those issues and we've got some strong partners in First 5 LA and Children's Now and other organizations to do what we can to elevate this issue in all of its uh, manifestations both for the learning for kids but also for the workers who engage in those activities on behalf of all of our kids. And so we're committed to, to, to uh, working on this uniformly. I will make one correction to something Avo said. And Avo said that this was the last. And in fact, it is the last forum, but it is, it's like a season. And at the, at the end of the season on TV, they say, and continuing net season. So we're, this is, you, you've been with us for this season. We start in earnest again next season, next year, as we continue to elevate these issues with the candidates, with uh, whomever is elected governor, with the new uh, legislature to make sure that this doesn't go away. So this is uh, our first start. We've reached the first summit. Uh, on, a, on the way to the mountaintop. Thank you so much for being with us and, and have a wonderful holiday.